Hi everyone, so uh, my name is Bab and this is James um, and together with Vaish who unfortunately is not here today, she had to fly off to another digital conference somewhere exotic, I think it's Dublin. Dublin. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, 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 we've come up with this um, project called Referral Compass. Um, so uh, James is an anaesthetist, Vaish uh, works in the digital sector, as much as I can sort of explain from her role, and I'm a GP locally in Leicester. So this was my problem that I brought um, yesterday morning. Um, the problem um, uh, was sort of framed um, is around sort of the referral processes that GPs um, currently um, go through and <clears throat> essentially the time that's spent correcting inappropriate or rejected referrals um, at a GP surgery can be quite um, a large impact certainly on my day job um, and probably happens across most GP services. Uh, particularly in a surgery where we are reliant on staff that are <coughs> not particularly local all the time, so local <coughs> staff or people that are working uh, remotely from other, other, other areas, um, it's important that, um, that we sort of try and help uh, reduce the amount of referrals um, that are inappropriately made or that fail essentially. Um, so we thought that by redesigning the service a little bit and looking at some digital interventions, uh, we could help to reduce the burden on the administrative and sort of the cler uh, clinical staff um, in terms of these referrals, and also help to improve the success rates of the referrals as well. So um, obviously that's the sort of key um, clinical issue to fix. Um, we tried to we tried to work out how to sort of look at the cost of this problem, and we looked at it at three different areas. Um, so it's obviously a major issue in terms of time wasted on sort of inappropriately making a referral or having to correct that inappropriate referral, sometimes having to call the patient back to get that little bit of information that might be missed when the referral was first made. Um, <clears throat> sometimes obviously, particularly in certain examples, that can lead to uh, delays in treatment being received. Um, if a referral bounces back and that takes a couple of weeks to identify and, and resend, that, that can have an impact in terms of treatment being offered. Uh, and obviously patients get really anxious uh, when you tell them about referral times uh, and, um, and sort of, um, you know, it doesn't help if the referral is bounced um, or it's rejected inappropriately, it's inappropriately made or it's sent to the wrong service. Uh, we've got to go back to the patient, tell them what's happened and try and help them with the anxiety that creates as well. I'm just going to pass you over to James. Hello. Uh, so uh, just as part of this, uh, we just wanted to try and explore the whole referral process and looking really at kind of what referrals go through and we've divided it into the two types of referrals that the practice will go through. There's the high risk, low frequency referrals, so such as what well, we said earlier, the cancer pathway. So we'll, we'll show an example of a lower GI uh, bleeding pathway later on in this. Uh, so that's one group and then there's the other group of low risk, high frequency um, uh, referrals that go through as well. Um, so for this, we are going to really look at this high risk pathway um, and, and use that as a model. And we're going to use the lower GI cancer pathway for the example. And just as a kind of general outline of what would be expected to happen, so the patient would come in to the GP with whatever uh, symptoms they've got. The GP would see them, identify the patient as being at risk of lower GI cancer, and then really want to start a referral process. And ideally for the referral process to be correct, um, for the GP where that's working, they would need to have uh, the ferritin, the full blood count, the fit test, uh, and a, a, a rectal examination done all before the referral is made so that the referral will go through without any hindrance. Um, and the, the part of the problem we're having is to make sure that the, the GP doing the referral knows that all this information is needed. There you go. <laughs> so, um, so as James sort of said there, obviously the first um, step in the referral process is uh, when the patient's seen by the doctor, or by the doctor, it could be a clinician of any sort of uh, grade, um, and then they identify the need for a potential referral at this point. Um, and then obviously at that point, further testing might be required before the referral can be done, at which point the admin staff usually go onto the electronic referral system to put the referral through um, to the clinic that they need to go to. And then it sort of sits in that administrative um, sector for a while whilst they check to see 
what's happened to the referral, there'll be updates in that process and sometimes if it's uh, rejected that's the point at which it will be picked up um, and then the patient needs to potentially be re-referred or sent to a different department. So uh, we looked at this problem from a quite a wide perspective and obviously with thousands of referral pathways all differing across different areas of the country and sometimes within the city as well. Uh, we looked at sort of the problem as uh, sort of from, from, a, from finding solutions that sort of whittled it down to three areas that we needed to look at. Number one being <coughs> how is the doctor or the clinician identifying what needs to happen for the referral to be successful. Uh, number two, how can we monitor the referral process and identify where the bottlenecks potentially might be within the referral process so we can then focus our efforts on retraining or improving the service if it's an issue with the system or if it's an issue with the person, we can identify it there and then in the process of doing that we realised that we didn't really have a very good system for keeping the patient up to date with the sort of uh, status of the referral as well, so we could probably integrate something like that into the system, that's the third point we tried to sort of come up with a solution to. There isn't much left. That's right. We, this is our document essentially that helps uh, um, administrative staff to um, collate the data for um, each referral that goes through. They currently use system one based tasks to keep this sort of information, so using this wouldn't be a big process change. And it allows them to log who's done the referral, <coughs> who sent the referral, and what's happening to it. And there's a traffic light system inbuilt in the tool that helps identify patients that need to be sort of focused on um, if we missed the date for them to be ch uh, checked on and things. You see the titles? So, uh, Just need to go up. Sorry, yeah, there you go. Sorry, I can, yeah, so so uh, I can talk you through that if you go to the. Which side do you want to go? To the beginning, I think. Yeah, yeah. So we've got something that uh, <laughs> helps us identify the patient, um, the referral code, the severity of the referral, so the cancer pathway, is it an urgent referral, a routine referral for advice and guidance, what date the patient was actually seen, who they were seen by, what date the referral was raised, and who raised the referral, and has the patient been sent to a text message to tell them that that's this, that referral has been made, have they been sent a reminder to tell them what the status of the referral is at, um, and that sort of... Uh, follows along the form towards the right. And then we, um, so that will give us a, a way to audit essentially what's happening with our referrals and identifying where the actual issues with the rejections are, um, whilst also keeping us up to date with um, sort of patient, um, it's keeping the patients up to date with what's happening with the referral as well. The, um, the other parts that we sort of managed to identify is in the future we can make the interface potentially quite helpful for the admin staff um, to input that data into the spreadsheet. We, we, me and James don't have much technical <laughs> skills. We were a lot more base yesterday to help us with that side of it, but essentially there could be quite a bit of work to improve the interface of inputting that data on that um, spreadsheet. Um, so that's one area to improve. Um, and also I think, um, the next slide please James. Um, we managed to propose a website um, that um, that would allow us to um, help the clinician to um, see what the ro local referral criteria was and how it compares to the national criteria for referrals for certain things because there's sometimes a discrepancy between these pathways and that's probably where the issue of each clinician having a bit of different experience working in different areas sort of comes from. So you can see on this example, <coughs> our website's called Referral Compass. Um, you've got different types of referrals. So you've got your advice and guidance routine, um, suspected cancer, for instance, which we'll go to. Within there, we've got our lower GI cancers. And here we've got links, which are kept up to date because they're to the national guidance and also the hospital guidance. Should we try the hospital one? That shows you what the referral criteria here is, essentially. So that's how we would we'd have this embedded within System 1 for our clinicians to access during their consultations, so they'd have that there for them to see. My hair is a lot shorter than you think. Really? Yeah. 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 Um, so thank you very much. Uh, judging panel, do you have any questions? Are you gathering your thoughts? <coughs> Just so you know, that was the first time we built a website. Yeah, we, we, oh, well we, done. We yeah. Oh, well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
I was I was interested in you've you mentioned that you use System One um, for collecting some of the data already. Is the what what was the reason for choosing to build a spreadsheet uh, as a as a solution to this? And you've 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 spoken about sort of taking that spreadsheet forward in order yeah. to collect data. Is there a reason that you think that's the right way to go rather than uh, within System One? I guess one. collecting data from System One. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, for anyone that's used System 1, it's incredibly good at sort of keeping information if you know how to input it properly. Um, I think having all those different parameters around who's referred, what date they've referred, which administrator has sent the referral, and, and all of that sort of stuff uh, in one place, sort of the only thing we've identified as useful at the moment is tasks, so we can look at them all at one go. But unfortunately with tasks, you can't then tease out that information easily. Uh, from the task itself, so it's easier to have that somewhere else, for instance, in a spreadsheet. So that's where the spreadsheet idea came from. Thank um, sorry, uh, thank you for a lovely presentation. Um, I'm a bit naive as far as sort of IT. The spreadsheet that you put there, who actually inputs that data? I wasn't very clear, I might have missed it. So, from my understanding, <laughs> uh, so the, uh, once the referral has gone through, it will be set as a task uh, on the system, and then the uh, administrative staff in the practice will see a task coming up from the um, where it is. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the, the system, and they will then go through, look at what the GP has written and what the referral is, and then they actually put the the referral through the electronic referral system. So it will be the administrative task once they. Uh, pick up the referral, they will enter all the details in that spreadsheet and then the administrative task will also be uh, following that up to get each of the processes done in that spreadsheet. So looking at whether the message has been sent, looking at whether the traffic light system is green or red and if there's somebody who needs to be chased up to make sure the referral has gone through uh, and it will fall to the administrative task. And I think the, the idea is that this will help identify where the system is falling down to then hopefully lead on to a better solution further down the line. So it's a, it's a data collection exercise so you yeah. can start yeah, notice the patterns for yeah. a QI kind of process. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. So just following up on that comment therefore, does that in essence transfer the 90 minutes a day that the GP spending <laughs> over to the admin staff? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> It, yeah, uh, in some respects, some of those um, roles would move over to the administrative staff. But the idea is, is that if the whole process becomes cleaner, uh, the administrative staff never really change within the surgery. It's the clinicians that are changing all the time. So if we had a solid system there in place for the surgery to sort of rely upon, uh, any new clinician coming into the system would have a clear pathway mapped out for them, and we'd already know where potential bottlenecks might be. So if a referral came through from a new locum GP, for instance, for the two-week wait pathway, the administrative staff who are raising the referral would know that that's a particular place where there's a high risk of that referral being rejected if it's wrong, uh, whereas a clinician might not know that because they're new to the surgery. So I think that's why we want to move that away from clinicians because the big problem at the moment at our surgery is there's a lot of variety within individual clinicians practicing, um, whereas the admin staff, you know, um, Hazana's worked there for 15 years, so she's, they, they generally do stay. Interesting. No? Anybody in the audience want to ask a question? No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.